BioBalance HealthCast, episode 192, Myths of Testosterone Replacement for Women, part two. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Dr. Maupin and I are continuing a conversation this week uh, that we began in our last podcast uh, that was a result of an article that was published in a European uh, menopause journal called uh, Maturitis, and it was published in uh, volume 74 of 2013. It's an annual uh, publication. And what they had done in this article, two researchers and physicians in Europe who are well-known and, and very reputable, and in fact, we quote one of them in, in our book, uh, put together an article called The Ten Myths About Testosterone Replacement for Women. And they say it, even though it's been licensed and sanctioned since 1938 in Europe as a treatment for women, there are still cultural myths that abound with regard to the whole question of do women need testosterone, should they have them, is it a female hormone, how much is the right amount, what kind of side effects do you have, and so on. And those are the same kind of things that we have conversations about all the time. So we talked about some of those in our last podcast, and we're going to continue the conversation about them uh, this time. And the, the first myth that they identify that we want to talk about is the myth that the myth that testosterone replacement causes hoarseness in the voices of women and causes voice changes that they don't want to have. And this, this is something that um, they say, their, their, their research and their, they did, they quoted several types of research on giving women testosterone and then studying them and finding no voice changes. But I, I have seen a couple singers say that their voice changed when they went through menopause or the 10 years before it. And then when we replaced their estrogen and their testosterone, their voice went back to normal. Then I've had, I had one woman before menopause who had a low testosterone who, when she was treated with one dose, had a tiny pitch change. I couldn't tell. And, but she could tell in her, in her singing. I don't think that's the kind of changes they were looking at. They were looking at hoarseness. So we backed her hormones down, just her testosterone dose down a little bit, and she was back on pitch. So that is, so hormones may affect the pitch, but they don't affect hoarseness, okay? And so if you're a singer, that would be the only reason that a pitch, and it isn't changed very much, would be related, and it is dose dependent, so we can always decrease dose. But here they say it doesn't cause hoarseness. And I've had a lot of people come in and say, hey, I'm getting hoarse. Well, people over 40 get reflux. Mm -hmm. And reflux is the biggest reason to become hoarse. So we acid reflux. Acid reflux from your stomach. When you're sound asleep and you wake up with that <clears throat> burning sensation in your throat and that nasty mm -hmm. taste where your stomach has rejected Or you have trouble talking acid. in the morning mm -hmm. and you're irritable. Now, testosterone doesn't increase acid reflux. But having, but having said that, women in this over 40 group have a lot more acid reflux than the women below the 40 group. So oftentimes mm -hmm. it's a coincidence. And then they get hoarse and they're like, ah. Oh, testosterone right and so this article proves that it is not that and we've proven it in our practice but it's nice to have an article with a lot of medical research behind it that says that well and and that's what's good about this article because they take all this research that's been done in Europe and elsewhere for the last 60 years and they compile it and it's listed in the article you can find it will We'll post the link to the article on Kathy's mm -hmm. website so that you can find it if you're interested. But you can look at the research. And what they say in the article is that anecdotal stories and repetitions of bad science permeate the media and permeate the culture and lead to the continuing existence of these myths mm -hmm. and that they need to be challenged. Yeah. And that's why they've written the article is to challenge this bad science and, and these anecdotal stories that people just tell like, oh, well, I took that and all of a sudden my voice dropped. Well, there are other complicating reasons. And what they say in this article is that the research, there, there is no uh, conclusive evidence of any kind that testosterone therapy causes hoarseness or irreversible vocal cord change in women. There's right. none. There's no evidence to support There's it. There's no evidence. It's all either bad science, misunderstood data, or anecdotal stories. And evidence means cause and effect. Cause and effect. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's replicable. That you can go out that and you do can do and over and over and over again. Right. And one of the things that you have to remember is sometimes, like, we'll do pellets, and three months later, somebody will come in with 
a swollen leg. And they'll say, it's my pellets. Yeah. That kind of thing. Right. But just because something happens to you because you're on testosterone it's doesn't mean... correlation, not causation. It just, it just happened at the same time yeah. or was during the time you had the hormone treatment. It doesn't mean it caused it. I mean, that that's really ridiculous. I found a spider bite on this woman and I sent her to her internist, but it wasn't, it wasn't testosterone. Yeah. The testosterone just attracts spiders. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's, that made about <laughs> I was as much never sense. bitten before, but I mean, it's hard for people to know when they see all this stuff right, on television right. and it's it very misleading. So I'd rather have them come in and let me show them what it really is. Right. Then, you know, then have them believe this lie. Yes. yes. So, so that's, I mean, it's that's what you have to kind of watch for. Cause and effect is the mechanism of proven medicine. What causes the effect? And that's that's well, what we're trying to delineate here. And, and another myth that you hear regularly in your practice uh, that is distressing because people believe it and they think it and mm-hmm. almost everybody quotes it. Well, you know, it's one of those everybody knows kind of things is that testosterone replacement causes hair loss in women. Right. And if you replace your testosterone, your hair's going to fall out. Right, and that and and that is not true. It testosterone is not the issue. It's usually the a relationship between dihydrotestosterone. This article confirms this. Dihydrotestosterone is a metabolite of testosterone. Some people make more of it than others, and when you convert your testosterone into DHT, it's a re- it's the ratio between the DHT and the testosterone. So as the DHT goes up compared to your testosterone, sometimes that could cause hair loss. But testosterone, when you're given testosterone, that actually would negate that that ratio. Mm-hmm. More on the bottom means a, a lower ratio so that you wouldn't have as much hair loss. Now, hair grows in cycles. and I mean, we've done a podcast on that. Anesthesia, there's obesity, high... Right, there's a list of them here in the yeah. article that they yeah. talk about. Actually, what you they read, say read is... what they, there, what they there gave. There is given. no scientific evidence that testosterone causes hair loss in either men or women. Mm-hmm. That hair loss is a complicated, multifactorial, genetically determined process that's poorly understood. But they say there is a correlation... Mm-hmm. But they can't attribute it as causation to testosterone loss uh, and uh, to t- testosterone loss or testosterone uh, replacement. They say testosterone loss. loss right. That it, as you lose testosterone, approximately one third of women experience hair loss uh, and thinning with aging, coinciding with testosterone decline. But that's correlative rather than causative. Okay. And that if you replace the testosterone, the hair sometimes comes it comes back, mm-hmm. but they don't lose more. They don't lose it because of the testosterone. And that's, I, I love this article. <laughs> so and they've looked, at, they've looked at all the studies they could yeah. get their hands on. And their factual conclusion about that myth is that uh, testosterone therapy increases scalp hair Your hair's growth. increased. Uh, and it's gotten darker, which is just strange. I've never had that happen in a patient. I'm regressing into my immaturity. <laughs> regressing in age. <laughs> in something. All I wish right. mine would do that. Well, yeah. <laughs> like it's growing, but it just get darker. <laughs> mm-hmm. The next myth that they talk about is uh, the myth that testosterone has adverse effects on the heart. That if you replace testosterone in women, you increase the likelihood that there will be some sort of stroke or some sort of cardiac issue mm-hmm. that they will have. And that's not true. That's absolutely not true. Testosterone lowers cholesterol. Everybody thinks cholesterol is the only thing that the heart that that uh, increases your risk of heart attack, but it's not. But it does lower your testo- or excuse me, lower your cholesterol. It lowers your LDL cholesterol when you get it replaced with pellets, not in every form, but in most forms uh, that aren't oral. It also decreases inflammation in the body. Inflammation is the second factor that increases plaque in your blood vessels. So it decreases inflammation. Mm -hmm. It also um, has a lot to do with how you metabolize your folic acid. And uh, so that's homocysteine levels. Mm -hmm. So usually homocysteine levels are a little lower after we take testosterone. However, that's somewhat independent, depends on your genetics and, and how you metabolize folic acid. But the first two are decreased and made and the risk made better mm-hmm. a lower risk of heart disease so and also on top of all of that and on top of what they had here if you have any heart damage after a heart attack testosterone actually helps strengthen the heart the muscle, muscle right. strengthen so that your heart <coughs> failure 
that you may have had after a heart attack actually decreases in severity because your muscle, it, it's just like any other muscle, it becomes a better muscle on testosterone and makes it grow. So your heart failure decreases in severity and you feel better. Your heart can pump better. So this is an article about testosterone replacement in women and the myths that abound around it. But in this paragraph discussing this particular mm -hmm. myth, they make an interesting statement and they say there is data to show that low testosterone in men is associated with an increased risk of heart disease and mortality in men mm -hmm. from all causes. Yes. So men should definitely, if they, if they have any concerns uh, about dying, replace their <laughs> testosterone. Yeah, if you're worried about dying. Yeah, if you're worried about We're dying usually at all, all worried about you dying. ought to think about replacing your testosterone. <laughs> but they go on to say there is no evidence that testosterone has an adverse effect on, on the heart whatsoever. Period. Exclamation mark. In fact, it's the reverse. Yes. Okay. Okay. So we're not going to get heart damage and die from it. How about liver damage? Yeah. How about liver damage? Another myth that, <laughs> that's out there is that women who replace their testosterone have liver problems. That's true. That's true. Well, it's true that the myth it's true is that out the there. myth is out there, but yeah. uh, actually, the only thing that is that true gives about a that, foundation that little to that nugget myth. of right. truth, is that with oral testosterone, like Estratest. Yes. Estratest was a, a medication that was out there for a long time for replacement of estrogen with testosterone and it was pulled from the market because of liver tumors because when you take those two together in an oral formula it increases your risk because that you immediately put your testosterone through the liver and it increases the risk of liver tumors however the, this whole article says in a more aggressive and assertive way than you ever did you're you kind of try to shade to the middle and you say you recommend pellet insertions you think bioidentical is the best way to go but there are other ways that can be helpful and beneficial they say pretty assertively non-oral is the way to go for yeah. all causes and all treatments and all issues well non-oral and in, i agree with in part because mm -hmm. The oral ones go through what they call the enterohepatic circulation. Mm -hmm. First which, pass effect is what I call it. Right. That's, that's what you call yeah, it in the, in the book, book, the first pass yeah. effect. So it doesn't go through your liver if they inject it in the fat tissues of your hip. Right. Ever. So if we put pellets in, it goes through the liver at the very end after it's already been used. Right. But, but you don't get this the big load. Process. Yeah, you don't get a big load of it directly mm -hmm. into the liver from your digestive system. So. You don't get a risk of liver, liver tumors with non-oral testosterone. So that's their factual summary. Mm -hmm. At the end of that discussion, they say non-oral testosterone does not adversely affect the liver or increase clotting factors. Right. So, so you don't. You're not likely to get blood clots either. Right. And non. And and that's the same with estrogen. Non-oral estrogen is not likely is is not known to give you an increased risk of blood clots either. So why we give estrogen as a pellet as well as testosterone as a pellet in women, those are two reasons. I mean, not getting liver tumors and not getting blood clotting are two good reasons not to take oral hormone replacement. So this can replace both of them in the pellets. That's why it's much more efficient to do both of them together. And in your experience, not just your practice, but in your experience, more and more physicians are moving away from the orals and into the pellets is the best way to go? Uh, people come to me on oral often. They've been on oral like Premarin or Estrace or even oral bioidenticals. Mm -hmm. So I still see it. It's you about at least 50 50. Okay. Oral versus patches versus creams versus gels. I usually see, and this is all estrogen because there's nothing else. Right. generally out there unless they've gone to a, a doctor who gave them bioidenticals in the past. But in general, that's what I see come in my door. So then testosterone, the options are the shots, which the is shots. the testosterone cyprinate, mm -hmm. or the pellets. The pellets. And those are the two that are the most effective, pellets being what the most effective with the least uh, risk. But patches, there aren't any patches out unless they're compounded somebody made a cream and put it under a, a patch uh -huh. but there's nothing FDA approved because they went through three or four years of testing and then they rejected it for no apparent reason besides facial hair which is easy to manage and in light of all the things it does that seems pretty trivial I mean wax it you know that's not that's not a big deal so um, in any case so I it was think one of those that patriarchal self-protective yeah 
Yeah, like it just a good that that was their reason not to let us have testosterone because it's theirs. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> in any case, there there are creams with testosterone in it that I don't get um, very good responses with that. Mm-hmm. But in some people, that might be enough. It might be, but the regulation of the dosage and the consistency it's really, is more measurable, more more obtainable with the pellets. Right, and the pellets you get. They go up and they stay up and they stay up until you need another pellet and then they dip a little bit. We replace them, so they have a, a pretty stable baseline. Right. You, and you don't have something different every day. We want to get get away from that oh, up swings. and down right. thing that we had when we were having cycles. The only reason we had those, got you know, God could only make us get pregnant with up and down hormones. But we don't need that after we're done having babies. We just need the same thing every day, like men have. I mean. Okay. Makes us more stable and not so um, PMSy. <laughs> well, there are at least three more uh, myths mm-hmm. that I want to make sure that we get to. The next one is that testosterone causes aggression, and that women need to be concerned <laughs> about taking testosterone because it'll make them be irritable and aggressive. Both tes- both men and women, when they t- get their testosterone replaced, mm-hmm. they are. I mean, I only know of two cases where people thought they were more aggressive, but they were more aggressive when they were younger. And they had their testosterone. So it just brought them back to their normal. But out of the thousands of people I've treated, those are the only two people I can say actually felt more aggressive, at least to their family or to themselves. So that was because they were more aggressive when they had a high testosterone level. When they were younger? Yeah, when they were young. Okay. So I just brought them back to their so normal. So they may have mellowed somewhat and yeah. then they went back to what they had been? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Should have, but I don't know that when they come in. When they come in the well. door, yeah, yeah. I don't know that when they come in the door. One was a man and one well, was a woman. Interestingly, I mean, this article goes into further explanation, and I would be curious. And I don't, I don't assume that you know, but uh, <laughs> they say, in fact, there's a wide body of evidence in a large range of species that say estrogen, not testosterone, plays a major role in aggression and even hostility. Uh, through action at the estrogen receptor alpha. Mm -hmm. So they're saying that estrogen causes aggression, not testosterone. Well, that makes sense. Just think of the the mother bear. The mother bear just had had its cubs, and it is very aggressive at protecting the cubs. What's the dominant hormone in pregnancy? Estrogen. Hmm. I mean... So well, I've seen I've seen some angry women, and I've never once thought, "Oh, you've got too much testosterone." <laughs> that's yeah, that's that's kind of um, that's kind of one of those just little little observations that you can't make into a scientific. Observation. No, it's not scientific at all. It's anecdotal. So, but they but they have actually studied this and back what we say. Most of the time, men become more mellow and happy on testosterone, and women become. More mellow and happy and less irritable. Well, and that's what that's what this article says. It says in women, we previously reported that subcutaneous testosterone therapy again going back to pellets decreased aggression, irritability, and anxiety in over ninety percent of the women who received the pellets. Yes, that's the same. Those are the same numbers I get. Yeah, I get ninety five percent, but. Yeah, that's still really pretty close. close. All right. So their factual statement in conclusion is that testosterone therapy decreases anxiety, irritability, and aggression in women. That's right. And the reason we're reading this is because we can say it all day long, but we're reading an international Journal. ar- journals yeah. articles about that was very specifically studying all of the myths about testosterone. Right. So to me... That should give you more confidence in all of the things that we've been saying up till now, too. Well, and another myth that's out there, and it's one of the primary questions you get all the time for people that are curious about this, uh, females who are curious about this. And this is the most damaging myth. And and that is, if I take testosterone replacement, will that increase the likelihood that I will have breast cancer? And the answer to that is categorically no. Categorically, emphatically, absolutely absolutely no. no. In fact, testosterone improves your immune system. And breast cancer is a breakdown of the immune system as well as genetic and environmental and many other factors affect the cells becoming cancer. But basically, testosterone improves all the T cells and the T killer cells and and in number and activity, and it kills those cells. So when we have lots of testosterone, we don't get breast cancer. When we have lowered testosterone as we get through our 40s, we have a higher risk of breast cancer. So those cells get through our barrier. Yeah, they, they, make, they make the same statement a different mm-hmm. way. They say in 1937, 
it was recognized that breast cancer is an estrogen related cancer mm -hmm. and that testosterone is antagonistic to estrogen and can be used to treat breast cancer as well as other estrogen sensitive diseases including breast pain chronic mastitis endometriosis uterine fibrosis mm -hmm. and dysfunctional uterine bleeding that's so right. they say testosterone is a positive treatment for all of those things. It is. In my experience, it is. Okay. So the, the, the factual response uh, to the myth is that testosterone is breast protective and does not increase your risk of breast cancer. But decreases it. That's my add-on. But decreases it. <laughs> and then the last myth that they discuss is that uh, safety of testosterone use in women has not been established. Well, so there. No, they have a lot of studies that show that, they say that testosterone is absolutely safe. And if the only thing that even the FDA can find is that we get a little facial hair, mm, if we take non-oral testosterone, then I, that's a risk I can handle. If I, get, if I decrease my risk of all of these other th problems and diseases, right. decreases our risk of heart disease. De they didn't even discuss diabetes, but that's another thing. It, incre it increases our insulin sensitivity so it decreases our risk for of heart diabetes. for excuse me for diabetes right. and diabetes is a risk for heart disease as well right. so so all of these all of these things are actually saving if we take testosterone we're saving ourselves all these different diseases down the line alzheimer's dementia uh, and osteoporosis frailty all the things that we discussed in our book Plus, it makes us feel better in the now, and that's in the future. So we're preventing the bad things in the future, and we're feeling better and more productive and more sexually responsive now. So if the only risk is facial hair, what's, just think about it. What's, what's holding that? you back? You're saving lives. You're saving the quality of lives. Your and life. you're saving personal and societal money. Right. That's because not being spent on all these diseases and illnesses that don't happen. If you replace the testosterone. Absolutely. And and I'm telling you, testosterone treatment is a lot less expensive than osteoporosis medicine. Yes. That stuff is really, really expensive. And it has some pretty aggressive side effects. It does. It does. It's really diff It's really hard yeah. on the on the stomach and cause ulcers and um, and actually ulceration of the esophagus and mm -hmm. it's most there's a lot of women that can't take it. Plus, it doesn't grow bone as well as testosterone. Testosterone is yeah. a much better bone builder. So they say in the article, in response to the question, is it safe for women? They say testosterone implants, pellets, have been used safely in women since 1938. And a really fascinating addendum that they add is that in some cases there's data that women have used these pellets for over 40 years mm -hmm. without any adverse health effects. So one of the questions that you frequently get is, well, if I take it, how long will I need to take it? Or will I need to come off of it at some point because I, I uh, develop a resistance or an intolerance to it? And the answer is, based on the research that's done in Europe, no. I've been on it almost 13 years, and there's a lot of women that I inherited from the doctor that trained me who had been on it for 15 to 20 years before that. So, so now they've been on it over 30 years, and they're all doing very well. Okay. So this is... So we are excited to offer this conversation because we found scientific research in a reputable journal uh, on menopause and menopause treatments for physicians in Europe, Australia, and Asia. And in one place, instead of this article about osteoporosis and this article right. about heart disease, and this, so we or found it specialty. in one specialty and yeah. one collated research paper that was well researched and and well defended. So we hope it's addressed some of your questions and some of your concerns, and we will post the link so that if you choose to do so, you can look at the article and its identified research as well. So as always, thank you so much for listening. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit BiobalanceHealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at Facebook.com slash BiobalanceHealth. Find Brett Newcomb at BrettNewcomb.com.